Welcome back to the 69th annual Worsties with your host, Jared Buckendall! <laughs> this should be good. What's up everybody, Jared here, and it's the old end of the year review where I'm going to be talking about the bestest movies of 2018, the worstest movies of 2018, the most anticipated movies of 2019, but today, this is going to be a fun one. We're talking about the worst movies of 2018. Now, before I get into my top 10 list, let's go over some of the honorable mentions. The Spy Who Dumped on My Chest. This has Mila Kunis, Kate McKinnon, and you know, it's in this like buddy cop spy movie and it I really thought that this would be a funny comedy throughout this year, but overall it's pretty unmemorable. The Nutcracker in the Four Realms coming from Disney, it had some beautiful visuals, some really bright colors, but again, this is a very generic story. It's a muddled mess. The CGI is weird. There's this weird mouse monster thing. Disney, you didn't do a great job on this one. And these next three probably should have made it in my top 10 worst, but I will give them the benefit of the doubt. The last couple weeks, I tried to watch them on 1.5 speed or watch clips online. And these movies are Gotti, Mile 22, and Slender Man. Like I said, these are all horrible movies. They should make it in my top 10, but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt because I didn't actually give them a chance. Now it's time to get into the list that you guys have all been waiting for, but before I do that, let me know your list of top 10 worst movies in the comments down below. Starting off in the number 10 spot is Night School, the comedy from Kevin Hart, Tiffany Haddish. You know, these two big comedic forces coming together in this comedy film. It couldn't fail, right? Well, the writing was downright horrible. And if the joke did land, or if it was, if it had a little bit of flavor, then they really drugged that joke on way too long or hammered it into the ground so much that it just wasn't funny anymore. Not to mention the completely forgettable story where Hart's character has to go back to school to impress his girl, but then when he's in school, he kind of falls for the teacher but she's a lesbian? Yeah, it's complicated. Oh, and then there's the ADR that does not match up at all. Coming up next is the old Disney from page to screen adaptation, A Wrinkle in Time. With Ava DuVernay directing this, you know, this being a story that a lot of people are familiar with and a pretty solid cast, I thought that this would be something wonderful that Disney really had but this is a complete snore fest. The plot is completely incoherent. Like they get sucked into a different universe to find her dad, but the little kid knows exactly what's going on and where they're at. I don't know. The story just kind of drags on with these less than interesting characters and don't even get me started with the CGI. Remember when Reese Witherspoon transforms into a giant flying piece of kale? Because I sure do. <laughs> There is a reason why certain movies come out in January or February, and that's exactly the case with 1517 to Paris. Based on these traumatic true events, Clint Eastwood had the great idea of getting the actual people that were involved in this event to reprise their roles in this movie as the actual person. Great, cool, there won't be any PTSD from this. But yeah, due to this, the acting was pretty stiff and it was rough. I mean, these guys, they tried their best, but they're not actors. Also, with the mix of the story being structured in such a weird way, kind of jumping back and forth to the to the event, kind of killing the flow of the movie, and also the, the movie kind of being structured in this weird, almost vlog format. Hey guys, go over there, just act like you're hanging out, eat some ice cream, cream, stay at the sunset, we're just gonna be here, we're gonna be filming you, okay? 1517 to Paris is just a really boring film for such a traumatic event. Now you guys all know that this list would not be complete if my old friend Fifty Shades franchise showed up, and it sure does. Finally reaching climax with this final installment. All I have to say is thank goodness this franchise is finally done. I mean, this last one had really poor writing. Like, it was it was hard to watch. The character, the performances were just not there. Like, do you want me, I don't, am I supposed to believe that these two main characters are in love, their love interests, they care about each other? Because I don't. Because there is zero chemistry and Christian Grey, you, dude, you are a straight up stocking creepo. Like, let your girl be, let her be her own person independent be 
have her job to quit being a weirdo i don't know this is supposed to be a hot and steamy franchise but with the lack of plot points really leading anywhere and characters kind of just showing up out of nowhere this is less of a six to midnight and rather trying to pick a lock with a wet noodle <laughs> I gotta love films that have our main character or characters just with these goofy smiles on their face. And that's exactly the case with Truth or Dare. I will give it the benefit of the doubt that the end, the, the it was unpredictable. It was kind of fresh, it was new, but the rest of the movie, the performances from these characters, like, I don't care about them at all. I don't know if anyone really cared. It's just... It's just a snore. It's boring to watch these people. Aside from the performances, it's a very generic story with really poor and bad writing, and the movie essentially just kind of forgets its own mythology and makes stuff up along the way. Oh yeah, you've picked two truths, well, we're gonna have to go with a dare now. Yeah, I'm kind of tired of all truths. How about just dares now? Who's making these rules? Sometimes I wonder why I see these movies. <laughs> Robin of Loxley. Thank goodness, thank goodness we got a Robin Hood movie because this is a franchise. We haven't gotten a single one of these movies. It's been such a long time since we've seen this really unique story play out on the big screen. Okay, they tried to make it their own, saying that it wasn't the same story that we're used to, kind of putting it in this weird time era where it's unclear if it's the past or future. They tried. The story really didn't have any logic infused in it, like Jamie Foxx, your, your character stayed on a boat and ate rats to survive, to follow this Robin Hood dude, to train him to get your revenge? Also, the sheriff, you didn't know who was robbing the banks, but Jamie Foxx's character wasn't wearing a mask? At least the film has these really cool action set pieces with really quick hard cuts where it's really hard to see kind of what's happening and then tons, tons of slow-mo thrown into it. At least it had some least than interesting characters. Jamie Dornan shows up and it's set up for a sequel. <laughs> The old Cloverfield franchise, so mysterious, so under wraps. I remember everyone was super pumped when the Super Bowl ad came out, said that the movie's dropping on Netflix right after the Super Bowl. Everyone's hyped. Everyone wants to see this movie. Then two hours later, everyone realizes why it was dropped on Netflix. Cloverfield Paradox had some really cool ideas kind of thrown in there, but it just felt like it tried way too hard to kind of connect it to the overall franchise, specifically the first film. And the structuring of this movie, or the story in general, was really wonky. I mean, the stuff with the astronauts up in space and the different dimensions was really cool, but when it cut back to Earth with these two characters or three characters kind of showing what's happening on, on Earth, it really cut into it was that was the boring part of the movie and the thing is that's a significant a part of the movie like i mentioned it really killed the flow of the movie and overall it did feel kind of like just a generic sci-fi movie with these shock factors such as the dude's arm and the girl trapped in the walls <laughs> peter jackson hits at the number three spot what what's that uh-huh oh okay uh, word just got in that Peter Jackson does not want to be associated with this film, so he will no longer market it. Okay, so Mortal Engines hits at number three. I never want to walk out of a movie, and this was one of them that I just could not stand. It was boring. I wanted to walk out. Honestly, I never take bathroom breaks. I took one or two during this film. My understanding is that the source material is really good for this, but it just felt like a, you know, your run-of-the-mill dystopian YA story where this young girl wants revenge on this evil dude, and the evil dude has this big weapon or plan to destroy the world or this other peaceful civilization. Oh yeah, and that's only about a third of the movie. We also get this weird death promise robot zombie dude i don't know the structuring was way off the chemistry between our love interests was non-existent this just felt like a really big train wreck of a movie or rather city on wheels wreck i mean if the cities would have drag raced it maybe would have moved up a spot or two in my book <laughs> Getting High Marks is the awesome remake of Death Wish featuring one of the hardest working actors in Hollywood. This guy never phones anything in. 
Bruce Willis. I mean, was anyone asking for a Death Wish remake? No? No? No one? Okay. Just kind of with this generic plot and things happening just way too conveniently. Oh, I'm a, I'm Bruce Willis. I'm a, I'm a doctor and then this gun just shows up and these gangsters that I'm going against or killed my wife just happen to show up in my doctor's office. I will say that it was probably a poorly timed movie because, you know, this movie kind of glamorizes or really is a gun, pro-gun, you know, there's gun violence, a lot of other violence in this movie, and it, it, it didn't really fit with the time that the world is in. I will say that the saving grace of this movie is when the criminals are in the kitchen and they're like, where's the rope? We gotta find the rope. Who, uh, who, who is keeping rope in the kitchen? And lastly, securing its place as the number one spot. This is a movie I just saw, Holmes and Watson. Bravo, sir, you did it. John C. Riley and Will Ferrell. This is a comedy duo, and you know, they've done a lot of other movies. They land pretty good, but like Step Brothers was like over 10 years ago. They they've lost it. In this movie, it's essentially just those two playing off of each other, playing dress up with these fake British accents, and it's just a series of five-minute comedy skits that the, the, that the people just try to smush together to make a coherent film. The editing is wonky, especially the ADR. Like, what was the deal with editing in 2018? Is it really that difficult to get someone's words matched with their mouth? I don't know. Another thing is just logic is completely thrown out the window. I understand that it's a comedy, you know, things are supposed to be ridiculous, not make sense, but, but the thing is, it's a Comedy. I only laughed maybe once. I understand that comedy can be subjective. Anything and everything can be funny, but Holmes and Watson was not one of those things. So that is it. My list of top 10 worst movies of 2018. What did you think of my picks for the worst movies of 2018? I want to know in the comments down below. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you for watching. Follow all of my social media stuff down there. There's more videos over there. Subscribe down to my channel over there. And until next time, I'll see you later.